What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of The Sit Down. As always, if you enjoy this video, please make sure you hit the like button and let me know what you think of today's very interesting discussion in the comment section below. If you're new around here, you just haven't done it yet, or you're living on a rock and seeing this video for the first time, I don't know what you're waiting for. Hit that subscribe button below now so you never miss another sit down video. I appreciate all of you who have joined me here in my new channel. I love to continue to put out videos for you here on YouTube. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get into another very interesting organized crime topic. And one thing I've prodded myself on doing over the years when covering the mafia is discussing people that very few discuss. In fact, we have debuted many videos on people never discussed on YouTube. And I think today we're going to be one of the first to do it again. We delve into the very interesting life of Bartolomeo Bobby Glasses Vernace. Next on the sit down, Bartolomeo Vernace was born on March 29th, 1949, in the small Sicilian town of Campo Reale. Now, Campo Reale is southwest of Palermo, about 30 kilometers. And if you know anything about this area of Sicily, obviously it's not far from Colleoni, Alcamo, Cendiseppi Giotto, Castellamari del Golfo, all very big mob territories. Now, I do want to discuss the pronunciation of Bobby Glass's last name, Vernace. Vernace is Americanized. If you go to Sicily, the pronunciation is Vernace. Now, I do want to shout out a fellow content creator who did a recent great video on this. OC Shorts recently did a video on this really interesting topic. And I'll admit, when I first watched it, I didn't quite get through it. However, in looking into it, I was super interested in the pronunciations of certain names, particularly ones from Sicily as well as Northern Italy. Now, again, the name Vernace is Americanized. If you go to Bobby Glass's area in Sicily, I would have to imagine they would call it Vernace or Vernace. So very interesting. I urge you to go check that video out. Maybe I'll include it in the description. But Vernace's parents, Antonino and Melchiora Vernace, would emigrate to New York in 1955 when Vernace was just six years old. Alongside his brother, Michael, and his sisters, they trekked to New York. Now, the Vernaces would settle in Bushwick, Brooklyn. Now, we've discussed Bushwick, Brooklyn on this show. In fact, if you are a mob enthusiast or a mob history buff, Bushwick is something that you should know, and it's somewhere you should know. Uh, Sicilians have went to Bushwick and really emigrated to Bushwick starting in the 1900s, really up until the 60s. In fact, we know that the Bonanno crime family, Gambino crime family, had contingents in Bushwick. We would also know that in 1979, Carmen Galanti was whacked at Joe and Mary's Italian restaurant in Bushwick. Bushwick had always been Italian area, an Italian area. Today, it's more different. It's more uh, black and Spanish. However, in growing up, Bobby Glasses, who lived in and around Knickerbocker Avenue, it was rife with Sicilians in that time. Now, Bobby Glasses, by his early 20s, uh, which was the early 70s, began, though, not hanging around the Bananos or the Columbos. He would start hanging out over in East New York and Ozone Park with a segment from the Gambino crime family. Now, when we look at the Gambinos in the 80s and 90s, the antithesis of where the Gambino factions like the Gotti group, um, everyone after the Gottis, they all had etymology in East New York. In fact, in my opinion, outside of Carlo Gambino and certain others, one of the most important people in the history of the modern day Gambino crime family is Fat Andy Ruggiano. Ruggiano was regarded as a god in East New York and in Ozone Park because of the fact he essentially was the patriarch of the huge East New York crew alongside Carmine, Charlie Wagons, Fatico. There was a split 
in and around the 70s where some people went with Fat Andy, some people went with Charlie Wagons, like John Gotti, Angelo Ruggiero, all those guys. Now, Fat Andy created his own huge crew in East New York, and we've done videos on people like Nicky Carrazzo, who came up under Fat Andy. Now, this will head back to Vernage. Just uh, bear with me here. It's important to understand kind of the matriculation of these crews and how they're created. Now, obviously, Nicky Carrazzo was under Fat Andy, but so was his brother, Jojo Carrazzo. Now, in the life of Bobby Glasses, Bobby Glasses would be in the crew of Jojo Carrazzo really by the mid-70s. By this point, Vernace is actively involved in bookmaking, loan sharking, all the typical mob crimes. In fact, throughout Bobby Glass's life, Vernace was particularly involved with gambling. He had a gambling problem himself. He loved card games and dice games and baseball and betting and all those sorts of things. And if you know anything about Jojo Carrazzo, he had a huge bookmaking operation. So Vernace, an associate for the Gambinos, making money, doing what he had to do, and slotted under Carrazzo. Now, Carrazzo can be credited as starting many mob careers. Carrazzo had a huge crew, and all of the people under him would become high-ranking members of the Gambino family down the road. They would include Ronald Ronnie One-Arm Truccio, Thomas Monk Sassano, Bobby Glasses Vernace, Louis Mastrangelo, as well as Howard Howie Santos, who we'll get to. Say what you want about Santos. You can call him an informant. He is one. But the truth is, he was very well respected by Jojo Carrazzo. He was Jojo's driver and was rewarded the same respect to Jojo like a made man would. He could never be made due to the fact that he wasn't Italian. However, Howie Santos was not only around Jojo regularly, but Ronnie One Arm and Bobby Glasses, which we'll get to. Now, by early 1981, Bobby Glasses was making a bunch of money in bookmaking and loan sharking. Bobby had his own crew. He was obviously very involved with Louis Mastrangelo, but Bobby Glasses had his own crew, including Robert Bobby Werner Wenhart. Anthony Tony Bosch Vigilica, as well as an individual, a protege of his, Vito Vito Love Cortesiano. So Bobby Glasses had his own little crew as well. Now, one thing I did find, which is very interesting, according to the DEA, in and around 1981, they would talk very openly that it is very well possible that. Not only was Bobby Glasses in bookmaking, loan sharking, but he was also a heroin kingpin. Now, at one point, according to a special agent in the DEA called Luis Diaz, he would say that while investigating a trafficking ring, he was undercover and met two drug dealers named Bruce Erbacher and Herbert Frank. According to an affidavit, Diaz would tell the two dealers that he was looking for a new source of supply for clients that he had in Philadelphia. Erbacher, a drug dealer, would reveal that his suppliers were, quote, well-organized, meaning connected to the mafia or La Cosa Nostra. Now, the special agent who was undercover asked Frank if that meant mob connected, to which he responded, you got it. Now, after making several transactions, Diaz would say that Erbacher mentioned that during a conversation that his suppliers were, quote, two people named Ron and Pepe. Now, we would all know that Bobby Vernace, his nickname was Bobby Glasses. However, mob people and people that knew Bobby well, his nickname was Pepe, Pepe, remember, the drug dealer would say that his two suppliers were Ron and Pepe. Pepe would be identified by the government as Vernace. Ron was identified as Ronald Ronnie the Jew Barlin. Now, Barlin was a drug dealer and an associate of Mr. Vernace. Now, in another conversation, there was another drug dealer called George Glecker. Glecker's girlfriend would testify that she had once heard the names 
Pepe and Ron. And at one point, they had a dinner party to which Vernace and an associate came by to speak directly with Glecker and Frank, a drug dealer, for about 20 minutes in a bedroom. And that Glecker told his girlfriend, quote, that they wanted him to sell heroin too, meaning Vernace did. Also, Agent Diaz would say that at one point, they would bust Ronnie the Jew Barlin with this drug dealer, Frank, and a Gambino member called Anthony Cuccio. As he was making the arrest, the undercover noticed that the phone would ring. The man on the phone would identify himself as Pepe and ask to speak with Cuccio. Pepe would then ask Cuccio, quote, is everything okay? To which Cuccio would respond, no, and they both would hang up. So again, it is possible that in the early 80s, Vernace was making a bunch of money, possibly selling heroin. And that was discussed in FBI and DEA affidavits. Now, in 1981, in April of 1981, Bobby Glass's allegedly his life changes. Now, I want to discuss a person that um, is quite important to this story, and his name is Frank the Geech Riccardi. Now, Riccardi was a Queens gangster. He was connected to the Gambino crime family. He was connected to Vernace. He was connected to Carrazzo. On April 11th, 1981, Frank Riccardi was celebrating his 24th birthday in a bar called the Shamrock Bar on Jamaica Avenue in Queens. Now, this bar was owned by a Vietnam veteran called Richard Godkin. That night, Ricciardi is there with his friends and with some girls, to which a drink is spilled on one of Ricciardi's girls' dress. She makes a big deal about it, you know, causes a ruckus, and Ricciardi is very upset. At that point, Richard Godkin comes over and says, hey, you know, what's going on here? Da 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 Another person, another owner, John Diagnis, would as well come over and tell Ricciardi that they were the owners of the bar to which Ricciardi would claim, quote, no, you don't. I run this place. He then grabbed a bottle of vodka, sat it down and said, see, this is my place. I do what I want in here. Now, God can would then intervene and Ricciardi would calm down and then decide to leave. So, I guess the owners, Godkin and Diagnese, who were not gangsters, they were just bar owners. They were thinking, okay, beautiful. You know, we're good. This is diffused. Everything's fine. Now, according to the FBI, Ricciardi would then walk down the street to Jojo Carrazzo Social Club in Woodhaven. At that point, according to the FBI, he would go to Vernace who was at the club at that point. At the point, he would walk in. Ricciardi would find Vernace and Ronnie the Jew Barlin. They would then depart and go to the bar. And according to the affidavit, they would enter through the front door. Barlin would then draw his gun and the crowd scattered. Ricciardi would then go for Diagnes and he would shoot Diagnes multiple times. Vernace would then pin Richard Godkin to the shuffleboard machine saying, quote, where's your gun now, tough guy? Go for your gun. Go ahead. Go for it. Vernace would taunt him holding his own gun. Diagnese would then be shot, and then Godkin would be shot. Ricciardi and Vernace would then bolt for the front door. Barlow would run too, but not before he fired around into the ceiling, capping their escape. According to the FBI, Diagnese and Godkin would die the next day. So that was what the FBI believed happened from witnesses and onlookers. Now, I want to discuss one witness, which is very interesting, and it's a connection to John Gotti. Now, according to the FBI and multiple news reports, I want to discuss um, one of the witnesses. According to the FBI, One of the witnesses was a woman called Linda Gotti. She is the daughter of Peter Gotti, John Gotti's brother. 
According to Linda Gotti, she was the girlfriend of John Diagnese, one of the people killed in this fracas. Now, initially, she would give statements regarding what happened, and she would identify one of the people in the bar shooting as Ronnie the Jew Barlin. Barlin would be picked up and charged with murder. Now, several months later, Linda Gotti would miraculously recant her statement. Now, according to the FBI, she would tell them she was approached by members of her family and pushed to not testify, and that the quote, Gotti's don't testify. This was in the 80s. She would then recant. Now, down the road, which we'll get to, Linda Gotti would be called again to testify in the 2010s, and we'll get to that. But for Vernace, he wasn't picked up. However, he was spooked. Bobby Glasses would essentially uh, go MIA for a while. He would leave the area uh, until things calmed down. By the mid-80s, he would become a new man. He was still connected to the Gambino crime family, but he was quiet and he was secretive. Bobby Glasses would then take up shop at a cafe that he owned in Glendale, Queens, at the corner of Cooper Avenue and Myrtle Avenue in Glendale. Now, on that map, you can see a German restaurant called Zoom Stomach. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Now, according to Frank Fiordolino, who knew Bobby Glass as well, he would say that Bobby Glass has loved an Egg McMuffin burger at Zoo Zamach, which was right across the corner from his social club. Now, Fiordolino would say that he met Bobby Glass in and around 1989, and that at that time, Fiordolino was a young kid. He, alongside one of his friends, Paul Ragusa, who would down the road both be involved in the Giannini crew, he would say that both of them at that point were just small uh, bookmakers and looking to get a half sheet. And Bobby Glasses was known as the neighborhood gambling guy and that everyone kind of either was indebted to him or bet into him or bet into some of his people, including uh, Bobby Werner, which was one of his people. Now, Fiordolino would say that he always said that Bobby Glasses was, quote, very nice and was always willing to lend advice. He would also say to me that for Bobby Glasses, there were several things that he really enjoyed. He loved baseball and loved Mickey Mantle. He also loved to gamble, playing Baccarat and things of that nature. Now, by the early 90s and into the mid to late 90s, Bobby Glasses still was not a made member of the Gambino crime family. He was operating as an associate and as a mob-connected individual, but he was not a button man. Understand that. Uh, by the late 90s, though, he was called upon and became a made member of the Gambino crime family. He would be placed into the crew of Dominic Italian Dom Shefalu. Now, According to Fiordolino, who knew both of those people quite well, he would tell me that Chefalu and Vernace knew each other for years and that they had used to gamble together back in the day. Vernace knew Chefalu's father, who was also connected to the mafia, and that it was always going to be a union. They had known each other for years. And for Vernace, by the early 2000s, his connections to Chefalu allowed him to, down the road, become a very high-ranking member in the mob. We know that it's all about who you know in the mafia. For Vernace, though, he would have to duck a state case because in the early 2000s, the federal, not the federal government, the state government would bring charges of murder to Bobby Glasses in the Shamrock Bar murder case. However, he would be acquitted in 2003 due to lack of evidence in that case. Now, Bobby Glasses, in a recorded conversation, would tell Howard Santos a very interesting uh, thing about that. At one point, Santos would be recorded as saying, quote, you're in the clear now. You know, once you get acquitted of murder, that's it. You can never get charged again with it. In regards to the Shamrock murders, to which Vernace would respond, quote, the feds, they can charge you with it. They can pick you up and, you know, retry you on it. Hey, they can do whatever they want. So Bobby Glasses was a smart, calculated guy. He knew that he probably wouldn't 
skate. He was always probably going to be pursued on this. We know the feds never stop looking, and he's right. The state can try you, right? And if you beat the state, you beat the state. However, Bobby Glasses was a member of the mafia, and he knew that the feds would use it as a ace in their sleeve if he was ever picked up again. Now, for Bobby Glasses, his connection to Sheffaloo was obviously quite important. By the mid to late 2000s, after Sheffaloo went away, Bobby Glasses was elevated to the ruling panel of the Gambino crime family and became the number three in the organization, the consigliere of the family. He would, alongside John Gambino and Danny Marino, run the Gambino family. So think about that. He goes from being an associate to being made in the late 90s to by the mid to late 2000s was on the ruling panel. Remember, the Gambino family by the mid to late 2000s was a lot different. I mean, the Gotti regime was over. Arnold Squitieri was off the street. Peter Gotti was off the street. And the movement to kind of the present day Gambino family was being made. And a lot of people were in jail, right? So uh, Vernace is, is a very powerful guy in the family. That would last until January of 2011. As we know, 127 mobsters would be arrested in something called Mafia Takedown Day. Included in those arrests were Jojo Carrazzo, Alphonse Truccio, Bobby Glasses Vernace, and Louis Mastrangelo. Now, Vernace would be hit with racketeering charges as well as murder charges. He was right. The conversation from about eight years previous came back to roost. Vernace was pursued by the federal government in the 1981 murders of John Diagnese and Richard Godkin. For Vernace, this was the end. However, the question would present itself, would Vernace take a deal? Would he take a plea deal? It was offered to him. He was offered 12 years in this case. From what I understand, for whatever reason, he did not accept that and went to trial because he felt he could beat it. Vernace didn't beat it. He was found guilty after various witnesses came forward. The witnesses would include Frank Fiordolino, Giuseppe Gambina, and a man called Patrick Sullivan. Now, Patrick Sullivan was the bartender that night at Richards. Now, another person would be called to testify, Linda Gotti. However, she would be pulled from the witnesses. Now, she would state, this is important to understand, she would state at one point that um, she just wanted to do what she had to do as a good citizen and that um, she would tell the feds that John Gotti's wife Back in the 80s, Victoria had advised her she did not, did not have to testify if she didn't want to. And that was given to us by the FBI. But at that point in the 2010, she had been kind of removed from that family and she was kind of doing her own thing. She never ended up testifying. And I want to make this clear. Frank Fiordolino, who has appeared on this show, would tell me that he didn't really know why he was called to testify in Vernace's case because he didn't even know Vernace in 1981. In fact, didn't meet him until 1989. Fiordolino would tell me that he knew Vernace as Glendale Bobby, not East New York Ozone Park Bobby. But he would also tell me that just like any other mobster, at Vernace had to do something, he would probably do it. He would also tell me an interesting story that at one point, Fiordolino would say that he walked in on Vernace and uh, Howie Santos dishing a beating to a mob associate uh, and that he didn't really know what he had stepped upon. But, um, you know, he kind of believed that if Vernace had to handle himself, he would. Vernace would ultimately be sentenced to life in prison in 2014. His brother, Michael, would say at one point, quote, fuck the judge as he walked out of court. So he wasn't very happy. And I don't believe the Renee's family was very happy. Look, the truth of the matter was, Vernace had beaten this case in the early 2000s, and the feds, through certain tactics, felt they had enough. I would say this, in Vernace's case, he should have taken a plea deal. That should have been very important. 12 years for two murders and racketeering, not bad. It wouldn't have mattered, though. 
while serving time at Allenwood in Pennsylvania, Bobby Glasses Vernace would die at the age of 67 after he had suffered a heart attack. It was said by that point, Vernace had contracted diabetes, kidney, and heart disease. He is survived by his wife of 44 years, a daughter, son, and five grandchildren. He is buried at a cemetery in Airmont, New York. Bobby Glasses Vernace is not a name that many people talk about when discussing the Gambino crime family. However, he is just another spoke that turns the wheel of a very powerful mafia family. We've all heard the names Gotti, Gravano, Castellano, and Gambino. But people like Bobby Glasses are the ones that keep these families turning, kicking up, doing what they have to do, and assuming the position when they're called upon it. Bobby Glasses did that for years. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, let me know what you think in the comments below. We'll see you next week here on The Sit Down.